Dave Tilly, thank you for joining me today for the first episode of series three of the Gymnastics Growth Show podcast. And of course, we are recording this live while streaming to Facebook as well. Thanks for joining me, my friend. Nick, it is always a pleasure, my man. I jump at the opportunity to hang out with you for an hour and have another podcast. I appreciate everything you've done for me and for the community. And it's always appreciated from uh, my side of things as well. And look, this is fun. It's good for us to catch up. And there's always things for us to be talking about. And I can think of no better way than uh, kicking off series three than, than chatting to you. And we're not actually going to be really talking about um, the usual things that we might talk about. So technique, yeah. prehab, strength, yeah. culture, yeah. et cetera. We're going to talk about um, our own kind of personal wellness, whether that's physical uh, spiritual, mental, emotional, however you want to kind of uh, look at that and phrase that. And I think this is obviously going to be something that applies to everybody that's listening, because we all need to be looking after our our mental and physical health, none more so, or, or there's not um, a more important time to do so than what we're going through now as a as society, you know, and obviously you are in the States, I'm over here in Europe, but we've got similar restrictions, or we're kind of moving in and out of similar restrictions. And who knows what the future holds over the next few months. So I've been thinking a lot recently about my own triggers, my own patterns, my own habits, and all the things that I've got in my life, which contribute to me being productive and, and on full form. And then of course, I'm thinking about all the things which are detracting from my ability to be able to work at, let's call it peak performance. And, and if we really think of ourselves, and this goes, this goes for everyone, you've got to kind of consider yourself that you're an athlete as well. Mm. You know, and if you're going to be an athlete and you've got to be in peak physical and mental health, what are the things that we need to be doing in the day and what are the things that we need to be taking away? So that's really the context of what I wanted to talk about here. And in the first lockdown, I shared what I refer to as the six M's. OK, six M's, which were six things which I believe are very important for people to be including, hopefully on a daily basis. So I'm just going to quickly mention what they are now. And then, Dave, if you wouldn't mind telling me um, if any of those really resonate with you mm -hmm. in order to help you keep you know, productive as well. So the first one is, is music. And I believe that music has the power to really change our state. OK, so you can put on sad music and feel sad, but you can also put on upbeat, uplifting music, which energizes us. And if you've got that pumping around the house when you're doing things, then it can really change our, our state and the way that we're feeling. So I think that's important. OK, the second one is going to be mindset. And we know that it's so, so important that, you know, everything that we're doing physically is going to come from what's going on up here mentally as well. So we need to make sure our mindset is right. You know, our thoughts, um, which are going to lead to our behaviors, of course, our levels of self-awareness, uh, almost our uh, discipline as well. That's going to come from mindset. Next, we've got mantra, which refers to kind of positive self-talk and the, the language that we use and the words that we're using. We've then got movement. So how much are we moving and being active? Activity from a physical perspective, of course. Mental stimulation. That doesn't include social media. That's more about learning and growing as an individual. And finally, mindfulness, which doesn't need to be sitting on the floor, floor with your legs crossed, meditating, but it might just need to be the kind of that quiet time where you can just relax and get away from all the stresses that we are currently facing. So music, mindset, mantra, movement, mental stimulation and mindfulness. Now on reflection, I really need something in there, beginning with M preferably that refers to um, talking to each other and communicating and having sort of people around you because that's one thing that's not included with the six M's. Uh, yeah. I thought about mates. Hello, mate. That's something Hello, that mate. you say to me, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, I think, <laughs> and I think that's important to have there as well. What's your thoughts on this, Dave? Are, are there things that you think are really important for yourself and other people to kind of incorporate into their daily routines at the minute in order to stay in, in peak physical and mental shape? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I didn't really connect these dots when we first had this conversation, but there's two layers to this. One is how we were talking about, ironically, how we're not going to talk about, you know, things that are culture, flexibility, strength, prehab, I firmly believe that the epicenter of all of those things being better is you. And I really try to teach people that when I consult is that there's rings of how you change a gym's culture or whatever else. So it's, it's you, you dealing with yourself is the, is the most important aspect. And I heard an amazing quote from um, somebody I was watching on a podcast, but he said, the most important thing is, in life is um, how you talk to yourself when you're by yourself. You know, he's saying that's kind of the most important way to kind of sound this foundation. So with that in mind, people are probably thinking about like, oh, this doesn't apply to gymnastics or everything going on. Actually, it does, because in my own personal life, and we've talked about this on podcasts, we've talked about this everywhere else is 
the, the way that I think we really made a positive dent in our overall culture, but also how I was much happier because I was very, very, I had a lot of mental health problems and I still work through them is when I was not taking care of myself first before I was entering my gym, entering my clinic, entering my, my team with shift, stuff like that. So it actually is the best thing you can do um, to be more productive and kind of take care of yourself. And I used to guilt myself into not waking up early enough or reading enough or taking time for myself or all that kind of stuff, realizing that it was an inverse relationship between my productivity and how well I felt. So that's the first really important thing is that, you know, it's, it's, it's especially here in the, in the Western society, it's the burn the candle at three ends, never sleep, work harder, just push. You got to be tougher, that kind of stuff. And the, the more I gave myself time to take care of myself, the better productivity I had on the other side. So with that being said, um, the six M's you mentioned are almost part of my non-negotiable morning routine. That's what I was saying was funny that I didn't connect the dots on is I found that I am the most, uh, productive, happy. Um, I have, I have an, enough emotional bandwidth, which is really important in the work that I do to work with clients who are in pain, as we know, work with teenagers that are sometimes in a, in a, in a hot state, um, trying to talk to parents, trying to solve really complex problems on the science side of things. I have the most patience and emotional bandwidth when I do these things every day. So every morning now it's like a non-negotiable, whether it's a, a 15 minute session, cause I have a lot to do, or it's a two hour session or more, especially like on a long day off, I'll do this for three hours sometimes, but I wake up and I, um, you know, do the normal routine of morning stuff to take care of myself. But then I'm always probably getting some sort of tea. I'm journaling, I'm reading, I'm listening to music. I'm thinking through a lot of problems that I have or things that are on my mind that are maybe like, you know, it's really hard to think on work problems when you have personal life problems. So I'm trying to think through that. Um, I'm trying to go through any exercises that I've done. I'm, I'm happily involved in therapy uh, for a while now, and it's been very beneficial. So if I have work to do with him, it's great. But I go through all these things in the morning um, before I enter the world, before I look at my phone to look at emails or my social media, or I, I look at what my team asks for me for things to do. I always have a minimum of a half hour to an hour where I'm doing all those things. And I usually work out before I, I do that as well. So I'll work out at home or I'll do something um, where I'm trying to take care of myself, but music, time to myself, going over things that I think are important, reading some self-development books, uh, planning and reflecting on what I have to do, um, and kind of thinking about me as, as my own happiness and health first before I enter the world, quote unquote, of whatever else. And I used to, um, like I said, guilt myself for not giving myself that time. I used to be like, no, I need to wake up and look at my emails and, and deal with stuff. And as soon as I open my email inbox, or as soon as I look at social media, or as soon as I do something with shift or with champion or whatever else, I get sucked into things that I have to do. And it kind of lets me go away. So I really enjoy that hour now. And um, I think it makes me a better person in general. But I also think it makes me significantly happier. And it allows me to deal with some of the the personal life stuff that's might be on my mind before I have to kind of give myself and my time to other people. Makes sense. And there's so much magic in there. And I think a lot of people will be listening thinking, wow, you know, that takes a lot of discipline. And so how have you, how have you got to the level of being able to, to do that? Because that is disciplined, you know, getting up at a set time, getting specific things done, not diving into your phone, you know, making sure that you commit to, all those things that you just mentioned, there's, because I tell you what, there's so many reasons why people won't do that. And, mm. and obviously we sometimes, um, we hold on to those reasons and it forms part of our kind of belief system, our, um, our patterns basically, you know, so we kind of fall in love with the idea of, of not doing those things. Sometimes it might be, oh, my, my bed is too warm. I don't want to get out. Mm. Um, you know, what are some of the, 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 the things that help you to be so disciplined to be able to do that on a, on a daily basis, do you think? Yeah, well, the first thing is, is that I'm, I'm an imperfect human and I constantly make, you know, I'm, I'm running uphill like everybody else is. And so I don't want people to think that I'm some, you know, in an ivory tower that I have this all figured out because I don't. But um, it's actually interesting you ask that because especially in this, um, I guess, the second half of the pandemic, I think is it's becoming more, there's a lot more pandemic fatigue going on. So it's harder to kind of stay in, in a routine mode. And I actually have thought about this a lot, but like, I, I really didn't want to work out this morning before this podcast. It was the last thing on my mind. And I was like, I have to do it just because, and I think about a lot of times sitting in bed, like when I don't want to wake up, I'm like, why, why am I doing this? Why am I? Why am I trying to work out still? Why am I trying to work with shift? There were some times when I almost dropped all of my work with shift because I was like, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. It's exhausting, right? But I think about why. And I think one of the reasons that you have to be selfish a little bit with this, right? A lot of people are like, well, you're doing it for like the positive impact or you're doing it for your family. And that's awesome. Don't get me wrong. But if you don't 
really want to do it for yourself, then I think that at the end of the day, you're not going to have the stamina and the, and the actual um, delayed gratification that you need to achieve some of your goals. So, and the first thing is that I, I think a lot about, I want to be able to say that I've done everything in my control to influence a positive outcome towards my goals, towards the things that I want to accomplish, towards the impact that I can make and towards um, my own health and my wellness, right? You know, I've gone from a, a period of time where I really struggle with a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression. And I know that there's a lot of things within that that I can't control. I can't control other people, their thoughts, their opinions, how the world works what our president's doing, what the lockdown's doing. I can't control any of that stuff. What I can control is my choices and my actions and, and what I say to myself. So I want to know that at the, well, you know, at the end of a time period or the end of my life, maybe that I did everything I possibly could to influence positive outcomes. And I think about that on a, on a long-term project scale, but I think about that on a daily life scale too. Like when I end of a long week, when I lay my head down on a Sunday night or a Saturday night, and I think about like, did I do everything I possibly could this week to make a dent in the positive steps forward towards the things that I want to accomplish, the things that I think I have a, a unique opportunity to do, right? And am I doing everything I possibly can to be in charge of my own health and be happy and kind of take care of my own well-being? I think that that peace of mind is really, really important uh, to keep your motivation going. So when I'm kind of faced with a conflict of, do I want to work out or do I want to just kind of lay in bed for another hour? Do I want to write this new research article that's uh, an exhausting you know, labor of love or do I want to can't maybe just move on to another project? Do I want to have that harder conversation with this person or myself or do I want to kind of just let it like slide under the under the, the rug and not really worry about it? I think about that peace of mind of knowing I'm doing all I can to address a positive outcome. So that's one. Number two is I read a book called Helping People Change, which was very, I thought it was going to be more for helping other coaches and consulting and stuff, but oh, there it is. Yep. It's an amazing read. Um, but I've actually found that more of that was about my personal life and about what I wanted out of my own personal, you know, day-to-day -day work, my career, my, you know, my relationships and all that stuff. And it was really about, you know, you have to picture what's the ideal vision of yourself that you would like to achieve. And then what's the ideal vision of your future that you would also like to achieve. And so when I'm contemplating, you know, every choice every day, I think about, is this going to contribute towards my ideal self and my ideal future or not? And I also think a lot about when I'm cho making a hard decision, especially as, as some of the things I'm doing now have a lot more um, weight behind them and gravity. I think about, is this the ideal version of myself? Like is doing this the ideal version of what I want to be and who I want to be like? So whether that's talking to a kid who's maybe not doing all the drills you want and it's kind of being frustrating or it's talking to, you know, a, a friend of mine who's having a really hard time with a personal life matter or whether it's making a very large business decision or, or whatever else it is or, or whether it's to work out or not, I'm always thinking about what's the ideal one for me future. So I, I, I have my goals lined up, you know, and things that I'd like to strive towards. And I'm always constantly weighing, is this going to help me or not? So hopefully that is articulated well. It certainly is. Yeah. And uh, I think I can, I can resonate a lot with that as well is that I definitely don't want to have regret. So you just think, you know, okay, so I didn't achieve the outcome that I either wanted to or perhaps needed to. And I never would want that to be down to poor choices. Yeah, yeah, like you said, there's there's certain circumstances that we can't change. And, you know, we talk about this with the athletes, control the controllables and kind of ignore everything else. So, you know, I can't change the government right now. Um, I, I can't change what's happening with legislation around COVID. I can't change what's the kind of the conditions in which the business needs to operate under. But what I can do is make smart choices to kind of navigate through that storm. For example, you know, I'm absolutely accountable for getting out of bed because I've got a big workload and I'm absolutely accountable if I decide to stay in bed and not answer those emails, not get back to people, not work with the athletes. And there's no one else to blame apart from myself. And that's the, that's the thing for me, which, which helps me and guides me is that I would never want it to be down to bad choices. And ultimately mm. it's so important for us to remember that whilst a lot of choices is, is um, it's not always, well, it's not our, always our decisions. We have so much that we can still choose. And a lot of that is about choosing our thinking. And of course, mm. our thoughts are going to lead to our behaviors and our actions. You know, uh, gratitude will be a prime example that we can, of course, look at all the things that we don't have right now, but we have so much. In fact, we've got more than any other generation in history in terms of opportunity, resources, access to information and ways to connect. OK, we might not be able to connect, uh, you know, face to face. There might be some restrictions that are stopping us from doing that. But we've never had um, 
we've never been so rich in, in resources and information and opportunity. And, and I think that it's all too easy to look at what we don't have. And we should just bear in mind what we do have as well. And choice is something that has not been taken away and probably won't be taken away. You know, we are able to choose our, our actions and our behaviors. And so that for me is, is very powerful and very important that if I'm not going to get the outcome, then it, it should never be down to me down to, you know, a lack of work ethic, a lack of discipline, a lack of decision, uh, a lack of strategy, perhaps, because all those things just, just fall on my head and, mm. and no one else. So I can absolutely resonate with, with the message that you shared there as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you say that. And there's one more point I wanted to make, and then I'll definitely continue on yours is, is I think that people are oftentimes very, very fearful or scared of the anticipated discomfort of either the unknowns or work or, you know, fear and anxiety, it has a very good way of, of making a significant amount of worry of future discomfort. But in my experience, the pain of regret has always been worse than the, the, the discomfort of anxiety or fear or the unknowns or learning or working out or stuff like that. So I think it's important to remember that um, you do have to if you if you want to be productive, and if you want to do important, meaningful work, and you want to be healthy, and you want to be happy on your own, unfortunately, you have to accept a little bit of discomfort. I think that's something that I learned the hard way with athletics, but I didn't really fully appreciate. And I think we talked about this on a podcast when we were and I was in the UK is that athletes and people who come from gymnastics, especially are very good at physical discomfort, but they're oftentimes not very good with emotional or mental discomfort of having some hard conversations about their beliefs and stuff. And if you want to be someone who you're proud of, you have to accept those uncomfortable conversations with yourself, with a journal, when no one's looking right by yourself or with a therapist or whatever else it is to deal with that. And I think that's really hard for some people sometimes. And so discomfort is inevitable in life. I feel this way. You know, you can either choose micro doses of discomfort with a small workout or having a hard conversation or, you know, meal prepping for a week or whatever else it is, or you can not deal with it now and it's only going to come back in a flood down the road when you have health issues or when you have a huge blowout with somebody because there's this building resentment of a frustration and conversation you haven't dealt with or that first workout back after four months when you've maybe been putting it you know to the side is really really uncomfortable so i i think a lot about that how you have to accept willingly the discomfort and use positive self-talk to say like no i can deal with this i can do this and it's interesting you said that about um gratitude and stuff and i believe wholeheartedly in the the, the power of gratitude and perspective and positive self-talk if your actions map to what you're actually doing. And I had this problem for a long time, whereas I was trying to use a big old dose of gratitude every morning and a lot of positive self-talk, but I wasn't doing things that I actually believed in myself for. So I wasn't actually you know, proud of the way that I was acting and the choices I was making. And I wasn't you know, doing things that I was grateful for because I was acting in a way that was not you know, aligned with my morals. And so I think it's, it has to be both sides of the coin. You have to not only think positively and do things for yourself, but you also have to choose to act in a way that's moral and right and agrees with your values or else you're going to call out your own say do gap when that comes to the issue you're going to say like no i'm a great coach who speaks well to the kids and i take care of my health and i'm really nice to people but in your heart you might not know that when you actually snapped at a seven-year-old and you skip that workout and you're sitting on a block while people are doing rope climbs and you know you're you're not willing to have that hard conversation like i think that internally your own temperature gauge knows if the levels of doing and saying are the same and if saying is more than doing that's one problem. And if doing is more than saying, that's a huge problem too. If you're doing things that are really moral and righteous and you're being a good person, but then in your head, you're saying you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. You're not good enough, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's where a lot of uh, mental, you know, issues come from. So it has to be a balance of both that you have to actually, you know, make, make the hard choices. And I, I call it choosing virtues over vices. You have to choose the harder thing when it's the right thing to do consistently to be proud of yourself, to then believe those things you say to yourself and say, no, I'm actually a good person. I'm, I'm contributing to positive change in gymnastics. I'm, I'm leading with health and wellness. So that was just the other thing I wanted to um, kind of mention is you have to have a little bit of both. I've had issues on both sides where I was saying positive things, but I wasn't doing them. I've had other times when I was doing positive things, but I was trashing myself in my head and both led to problems. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, look, and thanks for sharing and being vulnerable with sharing your kind of own personal experiences from that as well. I think that's really powerful for people that are listening. And it shows the human side of of yourself and not just the machine that produces all this great content and, and uh, you know, contributes massively because that's the reality, right? Is that, you know, we are all human and um, social media and content and all that kind of stuff's great, but there is a human behind that. We're not all perfect, of course. And, um, you know, we're, we're, everyone's work in progress. 
And talking about progress, one of my favorite quotes, which I think kind of fits nicely into the conversation we're having is from The Greatest Showman, which is, by the way, the greatest movie ever. And uh, that quote, of course, is comfort is the enemy of progress. And I think that, again, it comes down to choice, right? So we can be, at the minute, a lot of us, maybe mentally, we're not very comfortable because we're, we've got a bit of cabin fever, we're inside, we're not seeing our friends. But hey, it's very comfortable in bed. It's very comfortable with the fact that we can actually, a lot of people are getting away with not really doing much. Um, and that's okay because they're at home and they can be in the pajamas all day long. And, you know, that's comfortable, right? And it's uncomfortable to be in your house going, right, I've got to do a home workout or I'm going to do a home workout or, you know, let me, let me do some education. It's not comfortable. It's much, much easier to put Netflix on, but how about just sticking, I don't know, YouTube on, uh, maybe listening to a podcast or doing something like that, which again, you know, this is mental inspiration, mental inspiration and, and uh, stimulation, sorry, will inspire, will energize and help people to take action. It's like an ecosystem. You know, you, you flood your brain with positive messages and great information. You're going to be energized. You're going to be inspired. But if you do the other thing, which is you kind of um, you sabotage your thinking by not actually giving yourself the opportunity to hear those great messages, perhaps instead just taking the messages from the news from social media, from negative people in your life, then it's going to have the opposite effect. Of course, you're going to, you're going to feel negative. Mm. So I think um, that quote there always again resonates with me. Comfort is the enemy of progress. Now there's a flip side to this. And from my experience, I find that my work rate, my productivity, my mental health, if you like, kind of comes in waves. And mm. I've got used to that pattern now and almost a level of self-compassion to know that I'm not always going to be able to perform at this yep. level, just like an athlete. And I'm not, um, I'm not of course comparing myself to an athlete in terms of like physical performance, because Dave, as, as you will know, I'm far from that. Run, for it, run. Don't, don't bring that story up again. We've, we've, we've dealt with that in series one or two. It doesn't need to be repeated. Okay. <laughs> That's going to spark some, uh, curiosity. Now you can re re-listen to the story about my kind of strained hamstring <laughs> in an earlier episode. Anyway, back to what I was discussing. Um, and now I've completely lost my train of thought, Dave. So you're going to have to remind me, where was I at? You were talking about uh, the mental uh, aspect of planned recovery, which I had a great point on. Yes. Talk about you, so. Okay. Yeah. So I can be, I can like at the minute, and I don't, I don't um, recommend doing what I'm doing at the minute, but I'm up at seven and I'm working solid through to midnight. I'm doing that through necessity. Now that's unsustainable and it's not something that I can do for a long time, but I'm motivated behind it. There's a good reason. It's I'm contributing. It's helping growing the company. I'm okay with that. Now I can only manage that for a short period of time. And that might be literally like seven to 10 days. Mm. Okay. But I can, I can work at really good productivity for a few months, but there's always at the end of that period, there's always kind of this valley where I just crash. Now some might call that burnout. And that's a period of time where I have to allow myself to go through that and not rush out of it. And that means I go quiet um, I'm not producing content, which is a reason why there's gaps between my podcast series, because I can't just do that and everything else all the time. I might travel less. Um, I would spend less time working just even at home. And I would spend more time doing chilled things. I might go fishing. I might, I might watch Netflix and put my feet up and I need that time. And I need that time. And you mentioned about being judgmental of yourself, but I need to be non-judgmental in that period as well. Just like you said, I'm actually saying my body needs this and my mind needs this. And that's almost like recharging myself for that next period when I'm working at full capacity. You know, I'm doing those long hours. I've got projects going. I've got back-to-back -back content. Um, but it's again, just like an athlete, right? You, you work hard and then you, you recover. And if you don't allow the athlete to recover, then their peak performance levels just come down. You know, they're not able to have those huge spikes in performance. So I think it's just super, super important to, to be, be compassionate amongst yourselves and give your body what it needs in order to recharge. Mm. Okay. And if it's not about recharging, then it's about giving it fuel. So, and the fuel is going to be what inspires you, what energizes you, what helps you to grow as opposed to what detracts from all those things. And so, you know, some of the more, I guess, cutthroat things would be taking people out of your life, which actually detract from your life as opposed to contribute, you know, emotionally. It might be um, like the news. I check in with the news once a day and I just go through the app and that's it. I will never sit and watch the news all day long. It's just filled with negativity and fear. It's just not healthy. And most of it, I don't need to know what's going on anyway. Okay. 
So that's another thing. Social media, minimize scrolling. I pretty much don't follow um, anyone. Like once I follow people or they, you know, on, on Facebook and things like that, make new friends. Um, I choose so that their content does not show in my feed. And that's not a personal thing. It's just that I don't want to be scrolling through, you know, multiple thousands of people on Facebook and seeing posts which, you know, are not really going to contribute. They don't contribute in terms of, uh, unless they're you know, really close family and friends. And so it's making smart choices and smart decisions, in my opinion. Dave, I think you've got something to say. I, I could sit here and listen to you talk forever. This is great, man. Um, I would just, I like to echo the importance of planned recovery versus escapism. I think that there's a very big difference in the way that, again, I frame this up in my mind is virtues versus vices, right? There is a very different uh, internal discussion with yourself when you are planning right okay on friday at four o'clock and i'll just use my example i'm like at friday at four o'clock i'm going to go to the gym i'm going to coach when i come home at seven i'm going to try to turn off and i'm going to try to watch tv i'm going to play games with my family online i'm going to call my mom i'm going to talk with you i'm going to listen to music i'm just going to do nothing right i'm going to watch a movie right and me completely turning off that's a very different planned recovery because i want to recharge my batteries than avoiding escaping numbing myself by watching netflix or going out and you know some people would go to the bar some people buy a lot of stuff some people go on social media everybody has their own different vice that they use um there's a lot of different things that i you could do to avoid all of your problems and, and, and issues or you can you can plan for those times when you're going to recharge your battery so i think it's it's really really important that somebody understands what they love to do what really makes them happy what makes them uh you know kind of feel more well rested and plan for those things in their schedule versus uh, knowing that you have a really, really hard conversation with a gymnast or a parent or your your wife or your husband or a boss, whoever it is, and you're just trying to find anything to avoid that, like the plague, right? So there's a very big difference there. And in my experience, my emotional bandwidth and reserve is the lowest when I am putting, I'm, I'm avoiding all the things I need to do. I'm not sleeping enough. I'm not eating well. I'm not getting a few workouts in per week. I'm not doing work that I feel is meaningful and important, right? When I wasn't doing those things, that's when I became the most burnt out and most stressed out and most miserable. I had the most anxiety, I had the most depression that I dealt with it from a career and a personal life point of view. And I had to really take that time to myself to say like, okay, what are the things I'm not dealing with that I need to address head on? And what are the things that I'm really, I really, really love to do and enjoy? And I'm going to plan time for those and not judge myself and not really care what people say about me when I do that. So I think that's very important. And I agree that there are times when also me, when you run a company, when you're trying to be a good person, the, the amount of work that you need to do every day to just be a good human who's healthy is staggering. So I applaud a lot of people. The most people I have the respect for are like the dad with a young kid, right? Or a mom with a young kid who's still trying to get a workout and who's still trying to manage their job, who's still trying to do that. It's so hard just to be a good moral person and take care of yourself and be healthy. It's, it's an enormous amount of work just to, to level, right? It's easy to be unhealthy and it's easy to be combative and social media argumentative. It's, it's way harder to work on yourself and admit your shortcomings and admit that you have mental health problems and that you want to deal with them, right? Everybody has anxiety and depression. Some just hide it better. Everyone deals with this. So it's harder to do those things. And I respect those people the most, but it's exhausting. It's exhausting to have to take care of yourself and eat well and work out and try to do that stuff and, and have hard conversations with, with athletes and with parents that aren't just like, Oh, I don't want to hear this, get out of here and just snap, right? It's easier to yell at somebody. It's, it's way easier. So there are times when I do the same thing, when I, I will work 90 hours a week, I'll work a hundred hours a week because of all the things that I have to do. I'm really excited and I'll work, you know, I'll, I'll see 20, 20 patients to 40 patients per week at champion. And I'll be running projects for shift and I'll be coaching and I won't be working Sundays. And like you, I'll do that for seven days or 10 days straight. And I'll burn the candle down completely bare, but then I'm going to ghost the world and I'm going to not exist for five days, right? I'm going to watch 11 Netflix series and I'm going to listen to music. I'm going to, you know, do whatever I want, right? I'm going to eat super well for, for a lot of that time when I'm trying to take care of myself. And then I'm going to eat a massive plate of nachos and not care at all. I'm going to go out with my friends and not look at my phone, right? Like that's just the only way that I think we can operate on these really intense cycles of, of down and up, just like an athlete would, like you said. And I think sometimes you made a really good point with personal social media. I had to dip personal social media, not because of productivity for shift, but because it was too much of a drain on my mental health and it was too much 
of a contribution to my triggers of anxiety. I have some some personal life issues with family and, and past relationships that are very triggering for me. And when I would go online and see, you know, people um, complaining or people, you know, talking negatively or the news or stuff like that, I felt terrible. And so I was like, well, I'm going to unfollow 75% uh, of the people on all of my social media accounts that aren't productive. And it's not a mean thing. I only follow a certain amount of people because I just want to be, you know, clear headed, but it's for my own mental headspace. It's not for I'm trying to slight people or be gossipy, but I just don't check personal Facebook that much. I don't use my personal Instagram, my personal Twitter, rarely. And even on my shift stuff, I just very am very limited with who I who I have in my feed because those things would put me in a bad negative state and I'd feel anxious or I'd feel some issues. So it's, I can't control what they post on social media, but I can control who I follow. I can control who I mute. I can control all that kind of stuff. And I log on, I post the stuff for shift and I hope that people follow shift and you and me and other people who are inspiring and make them feel better about their life. I follow a bunch of people who I who I really look up to and who I gain knowledge from, and especially on the medical world. And those people are my main feed. I don't follow any of the other trash related to, you know, stuff. And if a social platform, like especially one that's new and upcoming, doesn't feel like it's beneficial for me, I just don't use it. You know what I mean? And that's that's within my control to do it. So the more you can you can really follow yourself. And again, only you know those things, right? And I'll tell you from experience, I was lying to myself for a long time about like, no, I can I can do this and be fine. I can work 100 hours and be fine. I can, you know, it's not me. It's the kids. They're the ones that are the problem. It's the parents. It's this generation. It's the government, blah, blah, blah. And and I was just calling out all my own crap. You know what I mean? I was like, man, this is all just a way to dodge the real conversation about how you view yourself, how you talk to yourself, your core beliefs and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I had to have some really hard conversations with myself about, you know, the things that I was telling to myself that were really uh horrific, you know, mean. And as I improved those beliefs about myself and those things about, you know, being perfect in a work productivity point of view, and I should be working now and I should be doing this and I should be doing that. Um, it was, it was hard, but it became very liberating after the fact, because when you get to a state where nobody else's opinion matters more than your opinion of yourself, it's very freeing, right? Like, of course I want, you know, if you came to me as a personal friend and said, Hey, I think you did something that's uh, not so right. I'm like, oh yeah, I gotta, I gotta think about that one. But if Johnny Pants 44 on Instagram tells me that I'm an idiot, I really don't care. You know what I mean? It's just like, it is what it is. You don't know my life. You don't know what's going on in my head. So if you can free yourself from the opinions of other people and not need anybody's validation or praise, right? If you're not addicted to social media attention, like I used to be and addicted to validation and you can just say, my choices and who I am makes me a good person and I accept myself fully, man, that's, you wanna talk about productivity being the highest, when you don't care about what other people think about you and you really are just doing things for the best intention, it's incredible. It really is incredible. And I think that in the last two years is why Shift has been more productive because I finally have gotten to a place. Where I'm like, this is me, 1000%. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. If you don't love me, that's okay. That's fine. If we have professional disagreements, that's okay. Let's talk about it. But I, I don't need you to tell me that I'm awesome for me to feel okay about myself. And I think if more people focused on how they talk to themselves when they're by themselves and not what does Sarah think about me or what does this gym think about me or what does this parent think about me or what blah, 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 blah. Why did this person not want to date me? Why did this person not give me a job? You know, if you just stop going on that path, I think you'd be much more happy in your life. So that's just a personal experience of something that's happened in the last year. Wow. That, <laughs> you, that was, there was so much gold there. Um, oh. We could, we could probably just end the podcast there because we need to rewind and, and listen to that. Get that was Amazing. Thank you, Dave. We won't end the podcast, of course. There's too much value here, so we're going to carry on going. But again, I'm sure work, there's... workout so in. I got tea in me right now. I'm like, I'm revving on six gear. <laughs> well, there we go. And uh, again, I can resonate with an awful lot of what you, you just said. I feel sorry for Johnny Pants 44 on Instagram. He's going to get uh, a lot of hate now from our communities. <laughs> all creditness. That's a Gary V uh, sh little shit. Okay, so. okay, fine. Yeah. Fine, good stuff. Um. Or his DMs are going to blow up right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the what I was hearing is awareness, and you've only got you're only able to to um, speak about yourself, about your thinking, about again your your habits, your preferences, your motives, your biases, and all those sorts of things by having a high degree of self awareness, and that doesn't happen by accident. That happens through hard work, and it, and like you mentioned, it's the having the the sometimes and often uncomfortable conversations when you are on your own, when no one's um, just praising you just for the sake of it or whatever, but you're actually sitting down, it doesn't have to be with a pen and paper, but you're having some quiet time and just thinking, but going further than that, thinking about your thinking, you know, thinking about and questioning, almost interrogating your thinking, you know, why, why have I got that belief system? Why do I think that way? Who taught me that? 
is that a good thought? Can I replace that thought with a better thought? Um, people think that self-awareness is about knowing what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. And absolutely, that is part of being self-aware, but it goes way beyond that. And I mentioned some of them, you know, knowing your motives, knowing your biases, knowing your your belief system, your routines, your habits, your patterns. You know, this is all part of what we would refer to as being emotionally intelligent and, of course, having empathy. So knowing how those actions might impact other people as well and how other people are feeling about your own behaviors. Mm. These are skill sets, which, of course, are they go way beyond coaching. These are things that we all need in life. But you know, for me, I, I came and I think that you did too, based on what you've said and we've discussed in the past is that we, we weren't always self-aware far from it. I was completely ignorant to myself, you know, and when you're in that kind of frame of mind, you believe we as, as individuals in society believe we know a lot about other people, but it's so quick to judge without even reflecting on Well, actually, how about me? Mm. You know, we're quick to criticize, um, to gossip, to maybe to contribute to those discussions on social media where we need to just reflect and go, well, actually, what about myself? And that's the uncomfortable part. It's really easy to judge other people because that makes us feel good. It elevates our position of power, potentially. It helps our egos. It's, it, we're far less vulnerable when we're criticizing others. But how often are we giving ourselves feedback and reflecting also about our own kind of behaviors? So I think it's very, very important to reach the level of awareness that you've got, that, that you invest time. And I know, Dave, that that's come from um, probably pivotal moments in your life, which has kind of sped up the process of, of knowing, actually, I need to become more self-aware. That's mm. exactly what happened to me. Um, mentorship, so having people around you that you can learn from and that encourage you to take certain actions. You've got, obviously, a huge reading library. Uh, it, again, it's the content that you consume. If you consume content from people that are very unself-aware, you know, and the social media and society is full of narcissistic people these days, and so there's loads of that out there, okay, mm. then of course you're much less likely to become self-aware yourself. However, if you listen to people and spend time engaging with content, which comes from a place of awareness, then you're going to adopt those same kind of thoughts and same understandings. So I really think for everyone that's listening and just listen to Dave kind of talk about his experiences and being so vulnerable, which I'm very grateful for, that can only come from awareness. And that is an ongoing journey. We must always develop our levels of awareness. It constantly changes. It constantly evolves. And there's no maximum. You can't have like, a okay, I'm, I'm 10 out of 10 of my self-awareness now. I don't need to carry on. It's like it's an ongoing journey. As we change, our awareness needs to change. As, our, as uh, society changes, our thinking changes. Okay, so super, super important to invest time in, in becoming aware because if you're not aware, then it's kind of like burying your head in the sand. You can only yeah. change what you're aware of. And uh, a great quote, probably a Tony Robbins quote, first comes awareness, then comes transformation. You can't tra transform or change without having a, a sense of, um, of awareness around that topic first. And from my personal experience, it's really uncomfortable. And one thing that I, I really hate, oh, can you, can you remember when you used to do this? Like people that say comments like that to me, can you remember when you were really arrogant? Can you, can, can you remember when you did this and you felt uh, that was acceptable? Yeah, I remember clearly it hurts. Oh, still. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for bringing it up. You know, <laughs> I have to carry that with me for the rest of my life, but you know, and the reality is they are uncomfortable conversations. No one wants to reveal the skeletons in their closet. However, Again, the compassionate side of that is when I reflect and go, okay, yeah, wasn't the right behavior, wasn't the right action, should have dealt with it better. However, I was being the best human that I could be with the knowledge that I had about myself and everything else at the time. So I was being the best that I could be in that moment. It wasn't intentional for me to act otherwise. Um, you know, secondly, I'm a human and the only way that I'm able to evolve is usually through making mistakes and then learning from those mistakes. And I'm now you know, in a different place in my life, my level of awareness, my behaviors and actions as a result of the mistakes that I've made in the past. So I shouldn't be ashamed of that. I should have that level of self-compassion to know that actually this is part of the human experience. And it doesn't matter what anyone else says about me. They are also making mistakes all the time. Mm. Okay, so they're making the same mistakes, um, you know, or, or mistakes at the same level. There might be different decisions that they make, but no one's immune to this. No one is immune to making mistakes. Now, some people, and you could you could put Dave and I in that category, we're maybe perhaps a little bit more in the kind of public eye within gymnastics anyway, because we've got a platform. And so our mistakes that we make might be more public. However, 
It's not to say that, that anyone else that doesn't have that same platform is not making the same errors. Okay. Again, what this comes down to is awareness. Okay. Be really aware, but also be compassionate. Okay. Otherwise you can end up taking yourself to a dark place, thinking about all the mistakes you've made in life. And actually that's going to prevent you from moving forwards. And, and that's tragic really when you can leverage an error. Yeah. In the same way, let's put this into a gymnastics content. Let's say that your gymnast goes up on the beam or the pommel horse and they compete and they make, you know, they do a terrible routine. They fall off four times. Now, you don't want them to carry that failure through for their whole, whole entire gymnastics career. That is not them performing at that, their level of potential. That was a moment of either poor decision or poor preparation, something that can be resolved. You want them to go back in the gym and work their backside off and be in peak performance, you know, you want them to um, believe in themselves, to have confidence, as opposed to that mistake in competition, sabotaging another sort of 10 years of their life. And that is the gymnastics kind of context of it, if you like, or, or um, analogy. Mm -hmm. Just because we've made mistakes in the past doesn't mean that they should sabotage our future. It's a mistake that we can actually leverage in order to help ourselves. And I, look, I'm making them all the time, but I've become really comfortable with making the mistakes now. Yeah. And that fear of failure is no longer, um, well, it's no longer got any hold, hold on me. And so let's just use a different example in lockdown. Number one, I did some live streams and, um, I've got this amazing fancy setup. Now we've invested a lot of time and knowledge and expertise, but at the first lockdown, I had very, very little, I bought some technology, didn't know how to use it. And almost every single live stream I did, we had audio and video problems with guests popping out and in and crashing and yeah. Okay. A little bit embarrassing, you know, Nick Raddick Gymnastics can't do a live stream and and uh, not exactly the way that I want the customer journey and experience to go or the community to fill my content. However, I kept on doing them anyway because I knew that every time I made a mistake, I learned something that I could resolve for the next episode. And now I'm at a place where we've got a great understanding of, of those mistakes and we've rectified it and we're able to put on a really good stream and a podcast like this for everyone to watch. So you know, don't let failure or mistakes kind of um, sabotage your future. They're just lessons to be able to learn from. And we all are human. Equal as much. I could just sit here and listen, man. That's like jam packed full of gold as well. And it's, it's, it's super valuable for people to hear this. I think that people think sometimes, you know, either you or me or other people are, are like you said, robots who don't have personal life issues and don't deal with the struggle of kind of helping the world of gymnastics right now. It's, it's very hard. It's very intimidating. And there's one thing that you said that I think is really important for people to realize is that you and me and other people, I think you have to realize that the amount of time and work and energy that I, that we put into our personal or our professional lives, we've put the same, if not more into our own personal development. And I think like, that's the thing, like I take an hour every morning and do this stuff. I, I know you take long retreats where you fish and you think about these things and all that. And it's like, you have to be willing to put in the time and the effort and the energy I spent you know, resources for books. I spent money for books. I took time off from work so I could, I could have therapy appointments. I had more time and investment because it was valuable to me. So if you want to actually make an improvement, you have to do it. But importantly, something you're talking about is, is back to the point of how do you get to the, you know, the uh, people are probably hear me say, you know, like, uh, I, I don't be addicted to opinions and, and don't listen to this and people's, you know, judgments don't get inside your head and matter. How do you get that way? I promise you. And if you're anything like me, the, the things inside your head are way more terrible and terrifying and make you feel worse than things outside. If you can build over time with exposure and doing it over and over again, doing live stream over and over again, failing another live stream, messing up, right? Me with patience, right? I mess up all the time. Me with coaching, me with a shift project, it blows up in my face. It doesn't work. The more you do it, the, the more you realize that those scary things don't have so much of a, you know, a, 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 a bite to them as you think. And, and yeah, they're uncomfortable. A anxiety sucks. <laughs> it feels terrible. But the more you just learn to sit with it and kind of, and t you know, speak positively to yourself and say, Hey, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to get through this, the better it is. If you can, if you, any, if you can handle all the internal chaos, you can handle any external chaos. And that's why I think I've gotten to a place professionally for sure. Why, it, it doesn't, it doesn't hit me hard. You know what I mean? Like if I, I almost bankrupted the company when I gave my book away for free in 2016, I was like, cool, I'm doing the right thing. This is the right thing to do. You know what I mean? I lost well over a hundred thousand dollars in the course of five, like five years or so. Right. And I was like, okay, 
cool. This is, it is what it is. It's the right thing to do. But because I'm at a place where I don't need that, you know what I mean? Like professional money and status and people saying I'm great. Some people say I'm an idiot and I have no idea what I'm talking about. Some people say that I, they, they think I'm amazing and think so much. Neither one of them impacts my self-esteem for positive or negative. It feels good, but I don't think I'm a better or a worse human because of those things that happen uh, pr professionally. And I think personally, it's got to be the same way. So the more you can work on those internal uncomfortable conversations, it takes exposure. It takes dealing with discomfort. It takes those things. You have to sit down and say, I'm at a moment. I call them catalyst moments where I can either look the other way and I can ex go the easier route and take the, the side route, or I can accept the discomfort and run into this chaos and realize that there's clarity to be found in that chaos. Right. And if I just work through it and I try to learn from it, I'm going to learn something about myself or the situation that I'm not a terrible person. I just made a mistake. Right. I'm, I'm just doing things. I need to learn from someone. I need to make a, an issue, you know, uh, correctable or something like that. And once you get through the chaos, there's calm on the other side when you say, OK, I know now, you know what I mean? And I'll use a gymnastics example. Uh, five years ago, when we started talking to each other, one of our girls was starting to learn um, a, a shoot over hand and, and high level Yurchenko skills. Right. She wanted to do a layout. She wanted to do real stuff. And I was for the first five years of my career lying to myself that I knew how to teach a proper Yurchenko and I knew how to teach a proper shoot over. What I had done was spot my way through getting kids skills because I was stronger than them and they were smaller. So I was like, look at this great shoot over. Put them on the bar. 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 They tried to do it by themselves crumble, right? I'm like, well, wait a minute. It's, it's their fault. They're not doing it. I was like, no, I didn't teach them right. I don't know the points of performance. And so I had to humbly admit that maybe my big shot spotting techniques weren't really that cool. And I don't know how to teach a proper Yurchenko. And so I would reach out to you and I send you videos all the time still like, Hey, how's this look? Am I doing something wrong? Am I missing it? And that's me being like, you know, I thought that I was going to be this, this great coach who could technically teach, but I actually don't know what I'm talking about. And I've had the exact same thing happen with my personal life where I was for a long time, I was afraid of discomfort of um, un like hard conversations with people on personal life. I wanted to avoid it because I wanted people to like me because I needed their them liking me and their approval to be, feel good about myself. And when I disconnected my self esteem and my happiness away from, you know, people's approval, social media approval, fame, money, status, the girls doing well at meets, and I was just doing the things on my own to be happy. If I wake up and I work hard and I'm doing the right things, I'm trying to take care of myself, I feel good about myself, right? And it's, it's the opposite when I get addicted to other things, things that you can't control are influencing your happiness levels, right? Why in the world would you put your, your happiness and your self-esteem and whether a girl does well at a meet or a guy does well at a meet? What if the judge had a terrible night's sleep and he just doesn't want to be at this meet and he gives him a seven, right? And you're like, oh my God, I'm a terrible coach, right? Like, same thing with anything else in work, promotions or dating, right? Like some girl or guy's opinion of, of how you look physically is going to influence your happiness. Like you're going to let somebody else's subjective opinion of you influence how you feel. That's a terrible way to live your life. Same thing with money. If I don't make enough money, if I don't get this promotion, I'm, I'm not good financially. I'm not a good person, whatever. That's somebody like a mid-level manager could have just said that they don't like the way your shoes look and they're not going to give you the job. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's a terrible way to live your life. So you have to accept and willingly go into those things that are uncomfortable and it's terrifying. But when you get to a point where your self-esteem and your happiness is not dictated by external things. That's where you really feel a lot of freedom to feel, you know, one happier, but two is that you can do what you want to do. And so I encourage people, whether it's with professional or not to realize like, what are my deepest triggers? What are my biggest insecurities? And, and mine was coaching, right? Like I was like this, this coaching thing, I have a doctorate and I should be so important and blah, blah, blah. I should know this. If my girls don't do well at meets and make teams or go to nationals or whatever, I'm a bad person. And that's, that's, that was, that was how I thought when I was a younger coach. And it took a lot of detachment of my self-esteem and then asking for help. And especially on the professional side, I now have an amazing team that makes me look really productive. It was me delegating because I had a massive ego and realizing there's people who are better than me to do the tasks that need to be done. So a long rant there, but as hopefully in there, people realize maybe the first steps to take to get things rolling positively. <laughs> Gold again, Dave, really, really good content there. Thank you very much for sharing. And again, being so vulnerable, it's uh, it's looking at the comments here um, coming up as we're obviously recording this live on Facebook. Um, it's really resonating with a lot of people, just showing that these are just very human emotions that we all feel. And I should have said that. The reason I've gotten better at podcasts of talking, like there's going to be 10, 5,000 people who listen to me talk about my my biggest, darkest fears. I, I, it, I'm good. I've, I've dealt with the worst things inside my head about like how I feel about myself that 
it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, and I feel that way with conversations, hard conversations with gymnasts or parents or with coaches. I used to be scared to stand on the floor in front of hard routines because everyone literally knew who I was. Like, oh, that's Dave. He likes a PT and this and that. And I was terrified. So I've conquered the things inside my head or I work on them every day. I have so much more to go, but I'm actively working on them as I speak. So I'm not afraid to talk about the things that are the most terrifying to me. One, I know it will help people. Two is because uh, if, if I'm inside my head saying the things that are okay, then outside noise doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Love it. Love it. And you mentioned a few times there about triggers, which comes back to self-awareness again, like understanding what your triggers are and maybe some of the behaviors which put you in a in a darker place. So I'm going to talk about mine to start with. And I've got and look, we've all got loads, because again, no one's immune to this sort of stuff. Um, and some of the triggers that are most um present at the minute. So I had a phase a few weeks ago that I was just I was just feeling generally a little bit low, lower than I normally would. But then I realized that I was, because of the lockdown situation and, and maybe the weather wasn't great outside, I'd actually, I'd not been outside for three days. Mm. And I don't know, maybe that's, maybe a lot of people can easily do the same thing. You know, we're not leaving the house for work. You might have, um, you might have all the food in, you don't need to go to the supermarket. Um, you, you know, you might not go outside on that particular day. It's really easy just to go, oh, just, it's cold outside. I'll just stay inside. But what that meant was I wasn't getting exposure to daylight either. And, you know, not only was I not moving or being active either, but it's, you know, I'm not getting daylight. I'm not being active. I'm not changing my environment. And all of those things were massive triggers for me to put me in a, in a really negative state. And then I started to go like, I need to go outside. Um, you know, what can I do about this? And so again, ch you know, choice. So now I make sure even if I've got a, a really busy day, I've got to get outside at least once in the day. And normally that's a walk with the dogs and with uh, my fiance, Leone. It could be just going to the supermarket, but daylight, fresh air is, has been so important for my kind of emotional and mental health. Um, some other interventions, I've got a, a seasonal affective disorder lamp, which is just yeah. one of those lamps that's on the desk because there's so much science and research behind those lamps in terms of improving mood, energy. Uh, I was getting headaches as well from not being outside or not having any exposure to daylight. So um, getting a lamp, which cost me, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 pounds on Amazon. You know, and it's been great. I've just put it on for half an hour so far. I'm in the early stages of using it. And um, again, it's a choice. Just as there's little things, little interventions that we can do, but you've got to come and start with what the, uh, what the trigger was. And that only comes from awareness, doesn't it? So if yeah. some of you are feeling lethargic, there's a good chance that there's something that you could be doing to change that. And that could be related to diet and nutrition. It could be doing, could, could be to do with the, um, the content that you're consuming, which is very draining. It probably is something to do with your kind of, uh, your routine or lack of routine. Yeah. And these are all things that you've got control over. Yeah. So start with those first, you know, find the interventions, which you've got total control over. And it's almost like a checklist, right? Okay. My diet seems to be incredible right now, but I'm still feeling lethargic, right? I've got to move more. Okay. Maybe my sleep routine is not correct. I'm not getting deep enough sleep, enough sleep. Maybe that I'm just being emotionally drained by everything that's going on in the news. Okay. Intervention, check the news once a day only, or, or once every other day, you know, there's always things that we can do. It comes back to choice. I think I've mentioned the word awareness, triggers, and choice multiple times throughout this podcast, but I think that they're really key kind of buzzwords for us to be, um, for us to be thinking about. Okay. Another thing is for me, I will always find a reason to not exercise uh, instead of doing work because I am like at the minute I said, I'm, I'm working like, you know, 18 hour days, uh, 17 hour days. And it's fine because my workload is massive. So it's really easy for me to go, I'm not going to exercise today. And now the only way for me to make sure that I commit to that is having the accountability of someone else, basically a workout partner. So what I've been doing, one of my best buddies, we've been doing Zoom workouts together, just me and him. Uh, um, Leonie sometimes join in, joins in and his partner. And therefore, I know that if I have to cancel that, then that is not good from, from his perspective. And he needs that time for his yep. mental health as well and his physical health as much as I do. And so we're now, we've got that sense of accountability and that's really helped me to say, when's our next workout? Okay, it's Thursday at four. Bam, it's in the diary and it doesn't move. And so sometimes if we, I'm not saying that, you know, um, yeah, okay, I will say this. Sometimes it's too easy for us when we're on our own to say yes or no, to go, you know, I'm just not going to exercise. I'm going to stay on the sofa. I can't be bothered. It's far harder when you've got someone else holding you accountable or you've committed to that with somebody else. So for me, being out in the daylight, super, super important to get some fresh air, 
super important to work out of course makes me feel physically better and um those are some of the some of the important things for me and some of my triggers and of course all the stuff we've discussed you know i'm trying to stay off social media as much as i can i yep. don't watch the news um at all once a day i might flick into it and that's about it so dave go over to you triggers maybe you don't know, you don't have to of course talk about them but what does, what does that mean to you yeah, I'll, I'll share exactly too. The first framework is that something I've learned through just a bunch of reading and work is, you know, those triggers, the reason why they're hard is they open like your Pandora's box of your worst insecurities and your worst fears and your worst vulnerabilities, the things that are the most, you know, terrifying that you have in your own life. And so those things lead to negative feelings, negative beliefs, negative self-talk. And what you have to do is realize those triggers, be aware of them, be uh, aware and accepting of those insecurities and stuff like that. And then also have a set of choices like, okay, when this happens, this is my typical choice that I always do. This is the actions that I have. And here's my new choices that I'm going to do inside instead of this to realize I need to make a different, you know, course of action here. And so, yeah, I have triggers too, is right. Like I talked about my personal life. I had a lot of um, anxiety and a lot of issues around my uh, family dynamics and around some of my personal relationships on that side of like the non shift life. And when those things would happen, it would open up my biggest fears and insecurities about me as a human and the things that I was most insecure about or scared about talking about. And so I would have the same problems of negative feelings. And my my go to response is to to retract from the world to isolate myself to bunker down to bury my feelings and not deal with it head on. And so I realized over time that those are, you know, not healthy. And that's the reason why I'm having so much misery because the things in my head that are happening, my maybe some core beliefs that I have about myself in the world that are maybe distorted. And then I have to have a new set of actions to do that. And so now when those moments of discomfort come, and I'm like, Oh, God, I just want to you know, I would literally stay inside for four days in a row and not talk to anybody. Like, I just want to read and work and not think about the world. And that's an unhealthy thing for me to do. So now instead, it's for my professional side of my life, I have a set of people who when I have a professional problem, I can go to them and ask for help you and many other people and, and more of like the business world, my mentors. But then also on my personal life, I have some people who know the Dave behind shift and just me as a human and don't care about the rest of my business world. And you're one of them who kind of thankfully is in both lanes. But I have another best friend, Eva, who I force myself to have a conversation, a hard conversation with them. Just like, I need to get this out. I need to say something. So a lot of people feel there's like this, like, um, this is true. The, the, the world at large, you know, kind of looks down on, on mental health and, and doesn't want you to deal with it. But if you had a broken ankle, you'd go to a doctor and get it checked out. But if you have a, a broken brain, right, you have not a broken brain, you have an injured or a temporarily bruised brain that you can't go to a doctor and get that figured out because they're just going to toss antidepressants at you. Right. But I, found it through a therapist and through some really, really close friends who aren't going to, you know, care about what I say related to shift because they like me as a human. So I have people that was what was really important to me was finding people that were very uh, one or two people who let who just would be willing to talk to me about this. And I reciprocate for them when they need it. But they're, they're helpful because not only are they empathetic, and they'll listen, right, and they'll be willing to let me vent a little bit. But they also challenge me. So, okay, okay, well, what are we going to do about it? Right? The, the you don't want a pity party. You don't want someone to say, woe is me. Oh, that's so sad. I'm so hard to hear that. Oh, that's the world. The world is so tough on you. You want to say something like, man, that's hard. Like I'd be upset too. That sucks. But these are the cards you're dealt. So what are we going to do about it? What can we control? What's out of our control? What do we have to let go of? What can we deal with? What are some practical things we can change? Who can we talk to? What can we learn from? Are there something we're missing? Is there a different angle we can take on this? What are some alternative thought pro like perspectives about this? Are you assuming things versus guessing things? Or sorry, versus just looking at facts? Like what are the facts of this conversation and argument versus what are you saying or assuming based on some negative, you know, disdain you have? Are you jumping to conclusions, right? Are you trying to jump to a, a thing that you don't know factually about it? And that was really helpful for me. So for me, on a on a tactical level, it was sleep, right? Sleeping far and away easily is the number one thing that I wasn't doing enough. I was getting six hours of sleep working from 5 a.m. to 12 p.m. for multiple weeks in a row because I was like, I got to be hardcore. I got to do this, right? And for me, it was also like I had this rare moment to help a lot of people. I need to, I need to take advantage of this. I need to do it all myself. So it was sleeping, right? And then having those people who I can talk to and kind of get help from. But then also is having a team around me. Like I, I have an incredible team with Shift now of people who help me because, you know, Becky is amazing at digital media and she's way better doing the podcast than me. And I have Taylor who's a, a wizard with numbers and she's way better at analytics than I am. And because I have those people and I delegate, it allows me to do what I love, but it also allows me more time to journal, to think about this, to sleep, to have hard conversations, to be creative and do the things that I really love and that give me passion, not slogging through numbers of podcast analytics that Taylor's like, I love that. Let me do that. You know what I mean? So those three things, sleep, having the right few people to talk to about your, your, your problems, whether that's professional therapists or just friends, and then being able to have, you know, 
delegate and find out how you can spread yourself across and help other people to help you and being willing and able to accept help or being willing and able to actually change your choices and behaviors. When someone says someone that you love close to you says, Hey, listen, I care about you, but I'm noticing that you have this, con this uh, consecutive pattern of an unhealthy habit. Maybe you're, you're not really sleeping enough, or maybe you're, you're not taking accountability for the things that you need to do, or, or maybe we're on social media too much. You're like, maybe you're spending a little bit too much money on stuff. And you, that's why you're stressed out about your finances, stuff like that. So sleep, people, delegating are the things that I would recommend. Nice. Yeah. Love that. And I think I, I can certainly resonate with the importance of having a uh, um, a, a small circle of very, very close friends that you can call upon for, yeah, basically they're not going to smother any advice and butter and honey. It's just going to be, this is how it is, you know, and I've got, uh, sorry, is that an English term that you've not, not heard before? Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh dear. You know, essentially, you know, we're just not, not going to try and make this any different than it is. You know, the re the reality is, yeah, Nick, I don't agree with that. I don't think that you're thinking this through, you know, Basically, it's, it's challenging. It's having someone there to challenge you, but they're not challenging you from a position of harm. They're challenging you from a position of love. And I think that's the difference. It's having people around you that you can, and I can count them on one hand. And again, you're in that circle. So thank you, Dave, for your friendship and your continued support. And, and, and I believe it's generally because you care about me and the friendship and you care about the results in terms of like the result, not necessarily being a gymnastics result or a business result, but what's the personal outcome of you carrying on doing this. So, you know, it's very important to me to have those people because otherwise we fall victim to our own bias and we've all got it. We've all got an elevated view of, of ourselves normally and, and our, um, our actions. I did this because of this and it was absolutely the right thing to do. Okay. Well then Dave comes along and says, Nick, have you thought about it from this, this perspective? Ah, I didn't think of it like that. You're absolutely right. Okay. So it's just so, so, so important to have that close grip, uh, close knit group of people that can really um, push you and challenge you as well as doing that for yourself as well. Are you, are you laughing? Cause you saw that bromance comment. I, did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, I have to not look at the comments because it's distracting while I'm talking. So. I, I agree, man. Like it's, um, it's, it's hard. It's hard to have that humility and to have that that ability to look again, back to our original or our comment we said earlier, when, when, when some random person emails me and says, you're full of crap, I hate you, like not hate you, but like, you don't know what you're talking about. I've had people tell me like, you have no idea what you're talking about because you've never coached level tens and elites. You're completely full of crap. What you're saying is not true. You haven't coached at an Olympic level. So you don't have any, you're not allowed to talk here. Sorry. Like you don't understand the reality of the situation. And I think like, hmm, yeah, you're right. I haven't, uh, I haven't done that. Um, on a coaching side, but I've actually worked with about 500 plus, you know, very high level gymnasts in my career. So maybe I, and it's that conversation with yourself. But then again, if that person who knows nothing about me, knows nothing about my work, about my professional, my professional life behind what just shift shows tells me that I don't really let it hit so hard. If you tell me that if Eva, my best friend tells me that if, if the, if the Mike and Lenny, my mentors tell me that then I'm like, Ooh, wait a minute. Okay. This is, this is a little bit different. They do see every part of my life. They understand what I'm doing. If they tell me that it's a moment of pause and reflection. And when I say like, I don't care about people's opinions or I don't value them, that's not like in the, in the egotistical, you're not good enough for me. It's that the people who aren't inside my inner ring, those five people that I, I love and respect and who I know love me as a human, if they don't, say that if all five, if someone emails me that, and then I ask you and I ask Eva and I ask my bosses and I ask my friends, I'm like, do you guys think this is true? And they go, no, no, not at all, man. Like, I think that person's just a little bit off their rocker. Then I'm like, okay, not a big deal. It's not that I'm ignoring blindly everyone's evidence. I value the community that I have in shift enormously. And I listen to them all the time. I answer every single DM, every email myself, because I care about them and I care about what they're, what they're going through so I can better help them. But when the negative, you know, gossip comes through about people who think that I'm full of crap, it, you know, you don't, you don't understand me. And I think that that's what we're trying to get at here is have the ring of people who can tell you honestly what's going on. And you and I have had quick FaceTime chats where you just call me like, man, I don't really know what's going on with this. Um, what do you think about this situation? I'm like, yeah, well, you know, uh, half of that I would say is maybe just a little bit of uh, their own projection of their insecurities and their fears. They're not willing to handle themselves. So they're attacking you. But then there's 50% here too, buddy, that I think that maybe you should think twice about this. Maybe you should really think about the the bigger picture here. I think you're, you're maybe acting impulsively or emotionally. Let's get a night of sleep. Let's circle back to this. Give me a call tomorrow. Let's, let's, let's go the pros and cons of this decision. And I think you and I have had multiple decisions or multiple conversations leading to decisions back and forth. And when you sleep on it and you get an objective point of view, you think about it on your own, you talk to somebody else and you go, okay, 
okay, I think I think I see this differently now. Um, I'm looking at the facts now and I'm not thinking emotionally because when you're in the moment, it's so easy to get revved up. But um, having people like that is so important. And, and I think Eva has taught me this and I'll stop bantering after this, but Eva has taught me how you have to have you have to disperse and lean on a lot of different people, right? Like if I picture myself in the middle, if I'm falling in one way personally, I lean on two people behind me, my best friend and Eva, right? If I'm falling in a, in a family life situation, I lean on my mom and my dad and my brother. If I'm falling professionally, I lean on you. I lean on other people in the world. Like, so I don't, I don't dump it all on Eva to help me with my professional life, my personal life, my romantic relationships, my family, my business. Like I don't expect her to help me with all of that. I have different people who are lattices and architecture to help me be survival. And I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I can do that for a lot of other people. A lot of past, you know, students that I've mentored help want help with their career, right? But then you and I have a different relationship, and Eva has a different relationship with her. So, like, it's important to have a a, a network of people who you can kind of jive with and kind of get help with, and not be so dependent on one person. Because yeah, it's unfair to dump your life on somebody else. But helping say like a little bit here and a little bit here, that's what that's what good friends and good family and good people do, and that's why meaningful relationships are so important to mental health. Love it. Absolutely awesome, Dave. Thank you so much. Look, we've hit about the 60 minute mark and I think that we've uh, we've given quite a lot of value. You certainly have given a lot of value here to the audience, which I'm very, very grateful for. So thank you again for being open, honest, vulnerable, um, human. And uh, of course, I always like to take this opportunity to just thank you for everything that you contribute to the community, but also into my life as well as a friend, as a professional, as a colleague. Um, yeah, there's a bromance here. You're absolutely right. So thank you oh, yeah. <laughs> so much. I got the tingles right now. I got the feels. <laughs> Good stuff. Look, we've got a good audience watching this live. Thank you so much for spending this kind of 60 minutes with us. Much appreciated. There's going to be more live broadcasts on the uh, on my Facebook channel, which is Nick Reddit Gymnastics, over the course of the next few weeks as we continue to record episodes of Series 3 of the Gymnastics Growth Show. Dave Tilly, thank you so much for joining me and kicking this series off. Much appreciated and uh, look forward to catching up with you again very, very soon. Thank you, everybody. And I'll speak to you all soon. Cheers. Bye-bye.